Thank you all for coming. My name is Ian Bushfield. I'm the executive director of the BC Humanist Association. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about this prayer, uh, this report that uh, Teal here basically led and basically caused to be written by a large part. Uh, before we begin, I of course want to acknowledge that we're on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. I don't just say that as a pro forma. I think we've tried and we're trying to work that idea of what does that mean into the follow-ups, especially to this report. We're working on right now, and I think too we'll touch on this possibly, uh, some follow-up supplementary, supplementary reports on how has Indigenous language been used in prayers in the BC legislature? How could it be? How should it be? Should it even be? And I think those are interesting questions. We're trying to get more Indigenous voices involved in those discussions, so it's not just us speaking for them, but trying to speak together and learn and think about these questions. Uh, tonight's discussion will be about this report we released last September. I don't really have a written introduction for Teal. I'll let him talk about himself. I, I see he's got it for himself. <laughs> but what I'll say is Teal reached out to me, I think, two years ago or so, 18 months ago, because he saw we were doing campaigns around secularism and these kind of issues. And he's like, I want to be doing that stuff. And I think the first thing you talked to me about was like prayers in the legislature. Yeah. And you're like, I want to get rid of those. And I'm like, we don't disagree as an organization. We don't think there's a place for state-sponsored prayers. That said, a lot of these questions like God in the charter, we'll get a lot of people being like, why don't you get God out of the charter or the anthem? And I'm like, I would love to, but political will is slow. But Teal is a different kind of person who doesn't care. <laughs> uh, and he, he brought forward this idea of writing a report and doing the research on it in, in a methodical and serious way. And then Canada Summer Jobs came by and gave us a bunch of money to hire Reneal, who's in the crowd here tonight, and Noah, who's in Victoria, and got them to analyze this. And we had 50 plus volunteers, some in the room, who transcribed prayers. And we actually made this a serious report. And it worked. And we managed to change the standing orders in the legislature, or at least convinced MLAs that it was worth doing. So. Thanks for reaching out, Teal. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. I mean, we've worked on this for so long together that I don't expect to be surprised, but hopefully everyone learns something tonight and comes up with ideas about how we can continue to move this forward. I'll pass this over to you in one second after I remember. I left my notes in my bag. Uh, of course, the BC Humanist Association only exists because we have members, donors, and supporters. bchumanist.ca give us some money, we're a registered charity, so we can give you a tax receipt. And with that, to you. Yeah, thanks, Ian, awesome. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna talk for a while, and uh, please do save questions. If you have a pressing question, though, please do feel free to raise your hand. Um, but I'm gonna cover a lot of this. This uh, talk comes from a, our 138-page report, and so there's it's comprehensive, and I'm gonna cover the topic in a as comprehensive a way as possible, dealing with philosophy, law, uh, quantitative analysis, um, comparative theology, and all sorts of things. So we're going to get into it really quickly. But yeah, so I'm Dr. Teal Phelps Bondaroff. I do a lot of different things. I'm a political scientist. My PhD is in politics and international studies. Um, I was leader author on this report. I do other things as well. So I um, am the research director for an organization called Oceans Asia, and we do marine conservation out of Hong Kong. Um, I also am the coach, uh, the co-founder and chair of the Access BC campaign for free prescription contraception. On your way out, please grab a card by the door, send a letter to your MLA. We've been working for the past two years to make all prescription contraception free. Um, and if you're live tweeting, um, it's at TLPB, and please do, because why not? <laughs> But yeah, um, and I need to thank my co-authors. Ian already mentioned them, but we have Renil here. We have Katie, um, Ian as well, um, and, and Noah. This team of people, we researched the report for two years and did all the background work, but we wrote the report in an incredibly short amount of time. Um, while Ian was giving, uh, his partner was giving birth to a child. Um, so it was literally like sending drafts of the report to him while he was waiting to become a father. So this is an amazing team of people and you guys did a great job. So thank you very much. 
And uh, we also had about 50 volunteers working on the campaign from both BC and, and further abroad. So it was a huge effort. And it was really great to have people doing citizen science, um, citizen, so citizen social science, coding content. And so what I'm going to do basically is walk you through a bit of the background of the report, walk through a bit of the background of the issue and contextualize legislative prayer in Canada and BC, walk through some of the legal arguments around it really quickly because um, we have a comprehensive report, and then get down to some of the data crunching and the numbers that we found and, um, and kind of go from there. So yeah, basically, Ian kind of mentioned the background already. I went to a session of the legislature after moving back to BC or to BC after finishing my PhD and was rather surprised that it started with a prayer. A lot of people don't know that legislatures uh, in BC, in Canada, most of them start with some kind of prayer. And I was not very happy about that. The UK, every legislature starts with a prayer, but it's uh, an established, they have an established church. So that kind of makes sense. Although going to city council meetings in England was a bit awkward. Um, so I was vaguely aware of it, but basically the, the project was born through a sort of concern for continuing the separation of religion and government and the idea that our legislature is not being very accommodating to different sets of beliefs or, or lack of beliefs. So the way it works in BC is we have standing order number 25. And so part of daily business is that uh, MLAs are led by one of their fellow members in prayer. On average, they're 89 words long, <laughs> which we found out. Um, and there's two different kinds of prayer. And those are the, uh, the prayers delivered by MLAs and prayers delivered by an invited guest on a speech from the throne. So February 11th in a couple of days is our speech from the throne here in BC. And there will be an invited member of the public usually a member of the clergy of some kind, to deliver a prayer um, to start that session off. And we'll get into who delivers those prayers in a bit. MLAs are invited to lead us in prayer. So it's an action, come on in. Um, they're, they're, act, they're asked to lead the group in prayer. So it's not an MLA delivering something on behalf of themselves. They're literally leading the group of elected officials in a public building in prayer. And there's two kinds of prayers that are typically delivered. Um, MLAs are given a script of five potential prayers they can read off of, and they're also able to give any prayer they want. So that's the practice in BC. So we found, and this is just a, you know, it's a teaser for the information that we found, 50%, almost exactly 50% of the prayers were the prepared, pre-prepared prayers. And the other half, MLAs are basically making them up on the spot. Sometimes they read poetry. Sometimes they attack local unions. Sometimes they read the Lord's Prayer. It was a huge hit and miss. It was a huge miss. And so basically, whenever you talked to someone about the prayers, they'd say, hey, don't worry about it. These prayers are super diverse. They cover a whole range of things. We had a First Nations prayer. We had um, a Jewish prayer. We had a Muslim prayer. But no one has ever crunched the numbers to say whether that is, the, A, the case, or B, to what extent that is true, right? You can have one Jewish prayer in 1998. It doesn't mean that you represented the people, <laughs> the Jewish people of BC with prayer. So one of the challenges with studying this is in BC, prayers are not hansardized. And hansardize is, is a great vocab word if people don't know it. It's the act of transcribing the content of the legislature into the written form. It's named after the Hansard uh, family that basically transcribed the British legislature for years. And basically, they start trans they're transcribing as soon as the prayer ends. So there's a word prayer. And so you can't actually crunch the numbers until you've transcribed the prayers. So we assembled a huge team, as, as Ian mentioned, of 50 people to transcribe 877 prayers from the past, uh, since 2003, to actually begin the process of coding them. Before we get into all that, though, um, basically, there's a couple other things to mention. In BC, the process for deciding who delivers the prayer is kind of a black box. Uh, we've tried to figure it out. Basically, the party caucuses decide who's going to deliver the prayer. What we suspect is that they sit around the table and they ask who would like to, the to give the prayer next time. And then what typically happens is someone puts up their hand and offers the prayer. It's typically someone who wants to give a prayer. And we notice later on that that's often same, the same person over and over again, or, or very much often. Um, but we don't really quite know that process. That's decided by the parties. The great thing, as Ian mentioned, is the process has been changed. So as a result of our report and consulting with the government, it went from prayers to prayers and reflections, which is a small victory. And we're going to run the numbers next year to find out to what extent that has changed. Um, but just as sort of a, a bit of a preface, when you ask someone to lead a group in prayer, even if they're able to do whatever they want, whether that's give a poem or read a prayer, they tend to still end their statement in amen. And we found even people reading poetry or reading sections of books or quoting songs were still ending their prayers with amen, even the most secular statement. So we found that 
I'm hoping that changing the title from prayers to prayers and reflections will actually encourage people to expand the content of their speeches. Because right now, a lot of them are reading off the script, and even those who are being as secular as possible are still ending in Amen. But before we do, a quick survey of the rest of the country, because BC and Canada is a huge amount of diversity in practice. So here we have MLAs invited to deliver a prayer of their choosing. That is the same practice in Nunavut and in the Northwest Territories. The Lord's Prayer is read in New Brunswick, PEI, and Ontario. Ontario changed their practices in 2006 so that now they read the Lord's Prayer and a revolving prayer that includes Indigenous prayers, Buddhist prayer, a Baha'i prayer, Muslim, Jewish, and Sikh prayers. So that's kind of their compromise, if you can call it such. Nova Scotia has a shortened version of the Lord's Prayer that their speaker kind of cribbed off of. Um, Alberta has a process where they, they have some prayers that are devised and delivered by the speaker. We didn't look into it as deeply as that, but basically the speaker writes the prayers and they tend to rely on, on a sort of set number of prayers they do. Saskatchewan and Manitoba have a non-denominational prayer read by the speaker, and I'm using air quotes for those listening on radio. And um, the Yukon has um, one of four standard prayers that are read before broadcasting begins, so we don't know what's said there. We'll have to send it someone on a road trip to find out more. Quebec used to have prayers, but abolished the practice in 1976. They now have a moment of quiet reflection. And Newfoundland and Labrador has never had a prayer. So there's a huge amount of diversity across Canada, from the Lord's Prayer, which is an overtly Christian prayer, to nothing in Newfoundland and Labrador. The origins of legislative prayer go back to 1558, Queen Elizabeth, when basically you had the speaker and then a chaplain delivering a prayer. And in Canada, the practice was adopted federally in 1877, and both the legislature and the, the Senate start with a prayer, which is pre-written, and um, you can find it out in the report or online. And again, it's allegedly non-denominational, but it mentions things like a god, which even when you mention something like a god necessarily limits the number of people who it's appealing to. Quickly around the world, um, the UK has prayer, but it starts before the chambers open, which has caused some controversy recently because those wishing to avoid it, including MLAs, get the worst seats because they don't have assigned seating in the UK. And so MLAs who were um, perhaps reticent to participate in the practice found themselves relegated to the back benches and not able to donut comfortably around the person who's delivering their presentation. Um, the U.S. is even more interesting. They have official chaplains, and it's a very cushy job. And unfortunately, um, only men have gotten so far. Um, and the chaplains make $172,500 a year. They have staff, um, and they basically are paid to deliver um, a prayer. But they also invite other people to deliver prayers. So they, I don't know what work they actually do, because most of the religious members of the House and the Senate have their own priests back home. <laughs> but they get paid quite a lot of money to deliver prayer. Um, but they have had guests. So for example, the first woman to deliver a prayer in the Senate was in 1965, the first Hindu in 2007, and, and so on. So there's been some progress there. As you can imagine, I know there's a lot of humanists in the crowd, that's probably why you came. Um, there's controversy around legislative prayer, right? And it's not new in Canada. Um, Elmer Sofa, an Ontario MPP, brought up the issue in 1969, and there was some controversy there. There's been uh, the controversy in Ontario when Dalton McGuinty proposed removing it. This is why Ontario now has the two different programs. And there's been some other ones um, along the way. The big case, though, is Saguenay. So in 2015, the Supreme Court made a ruling about, legisl about legislative prayer in municipal councils. So what happened was Alain Simoneau was a, a resident of Saguenay, and he would attend the regular council meetings, which were started with a prayer. The, the mayor would lead the council in prayer. They would cross themselves. There was a cross on the wall. And Alain took objection to this, and rightly so. And the Mouvement Lake de Québec, Québécois, took the case to the Supreme Court and won. And Justice Gascon said that the state has a duty of religious neutrality and clarified what this meant, because there's often controversy around what does that mean? Does it mean inviting everyone to give a prayer? Um, if anyone here has seen some recent Netflix uh, great documentaries um, about Satanists, you know, if we open it up to everybody, you can put your Ten Commandments on the lawn, and you can put your Satanist monument. Justice Gascon clarified what neutrality means in Canada, and that means that a state can neither favor nor hinder any particular belief or non-belief. And it was very, very strong in their wording, saying that this is a democratic imperative. This is fundamental. And it's worth reading what the statement it says. The state may not act in such a way as to create preferential public space that favors certain religious groups and is hostile to others. It follows that the state may not, by expressing its own religious preference, promote the participation of believers to the exclusion of non-believers and vice versa. So basically, you can't start a municipal meeting with prayer. Um, there are 26 municipalities in BC that didn't quite get that message last, uh, last time around, and we're working on that. 
um, and look for uh, that's a bit of a teaser for our next report. So before I get into some of the data, I want to explore those arguments really quickly because it's worth looking at, at the issue. This is recent. This is 2015, but these are this is something that was practiced in Canada for many years. So basically, the arguments against legislative prayer are quite strong, even from a religious perspective. So when you're talking to a religious person, you can say something like, "Okay, so prayer." is considered to be many as a sacred act. They're, they are talking to um, their idea of a god or the divine, right? And here we have members of, polit of, of legislature trivializing that action. Um, and our researchers found some amazing examples of MLAs taking the opportunity to take partisan swipes across the benches or to you know, praise shipping contracts and things like that, right? So here's something that most people who, who did truly believe in these things would consider to be sacred and people are making a political mockery of it. So even from a religious perspective, this isn't useful. And um, so that's problematic, right? And my favorite one here, it's, it's worth reading actually, because it's, it's, it's fantastic, but it was the um, Norm Letnick in 2011 used his prayer as an opportunity to threaten the HEU um, union workers. So basically he says, we pray, oh, so the context basically is that the health workers were just ordered back to work. They were previously going on strike. And he, he says, we pray to the God, uh, we pray to God to keep us mindful of the special and unique opportunity we have to work for our constituents in our province, and we thank the. Oh, that's shipping contracts. Never mind. Hold on, I gotta find my uh, HEU one. Apologies here. Gotta find Norm. Ah, here we go. Apologies. That was a shipping contract one, which is great because you're thanking God for shipping contracts. But um, so this is Kevin Kruger, 2004. Apologies. He's Kamloops North uh, Thompson. He's an MLA there. And he says, um, and I'll, I'll paraphrase here, and we pray for the HEU members who went back to work and that, they'll, that you'll help them to carefully appraise their opportunities and make choices that will be right for the ones, the right ones for themselves and their families. Right, so here is someone taking the opportunity to take a, a prayer and um, take not a partisan swipe, but a quite aggressive swipe at, at health workers, right? So even the most religious folks would probably take concern um, with that. A lot of legislatures, have the practice of excluding the public before the prayer takes place. And that's done to recognize the private nature of prayer. So that's, as I mentioned in the UK, that's what they do. And a lot of times, like in the Northwest Territories, they'll turn off the cameras so that the public can't watch. Um, and so that's, again, recognizing the private nature of prayer. In BC, it's on screen. You can watch it when you tune in or go into the house. And well, the final one that's worth reading, and I actually have some Bible quotes here, but Matthew 6, 5 says that, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Maybe there's a bit of a threat there as well. Um, but again, folks who take their religion seriously probably don't want it bandied about the political aisles. Having a prayer will necessarily promote a denomination. This is another argument against legislative prayer. Basically, there are lots of faith traditions the single word difference, you know, between Lord or Lord Father has a huge impact, and people have fought and died in wars for centuries about this. It is not the role of the government to adjudicate these kinds of dogmatic claims between different religions, and also, it's not possible to write a prayer that's not going to exclude or annoy someone of different denominations. It's just simply not possible. You start getting into um, distinctions between, like, simple words, but you can also get into other things, like... Some religions don't have a god, right? Or some religions have multiple gods. Or some religions have practices that don't involve prayer, right? So you are necessarily saying, we're going to invite you to do a prayer. It's super non-denominational. You are going to exclude people who don't believe in public prayer, who don't have gods they can pray to. Um, I mean, even, for example, using the term heavenly father, right, might exclude a lot of people who have concerns about the patriarchy. And, and well said that they do, right? Um, and so basically, there's been a lot of literature about like writing a non-denominational prayer. And I like to use the term like the off-brand religion, right? So it might be possible to write a prayer that appeals to a larger segment of the population, but it's so milk toast, it's so watered down, there's no point in delivering it. And so at the end of the day, you've tried to make everybody happy and you failed because it's impossible. And instead you've just annoyed everybody with off-brand religion and prayer. So you're always gonna favor one religion over another, one denomination over another, and it's always gonna exclude some people, right? And for example, some prayers, you cannot deliver a prayer of some religions in certain settings. Like we couldn't deliver some religious prayers in this setting right here because there are certain people present or because there aren't enough people present or because we're not facing the right direction or because we're not following the right hygiene standards or whatever it is. And so if you say we're gonna allow all prayer in this building, but some religions don't do the kind of prayer that can be done in that building, you're gonna exclude them. And then finally, of course, this is the more obvious one, 
you're excluding non-believers, right? You're violating the principles laid down in Saguenay that say that the state can't um, pick a side in a religious dispute, that it has to remain neutral. And so basically, you have the situation where, you know, um, oh, and by the way, it's, it's different than going to your friend's church to watch their choir, right? It's not the same as saying, oh, no, everyone's welcome. Because you can choose to go to your friend's church to visit, their, you know, see their choir. I got invited to a mega church in Calgary to see a friend, and it was, it was an interesting experience. The seating was fantastic. Um, the skits were high budge, right? Um, but that's not the same. This is a place of work where people are working every day. It's also a public place where government officials are working in an official capacity. So it's different than a couple of, of MLAs meeting in the foyer of the legislature to pray together. It's literally a state official acting in an official capacity, leading us in prayer, leading the group in prayer, implying state sanction for a thing. And this necessarily excludes non-believers. And it's not possible to deliver it in such a way that wouldn't do so. So there's been some arguments on the other side. Um, I'm an old debate coach, and I always enjoy canvassing these. And it's worth exploring them, because we can see why they were not compelling in the case of Saguenay. So the first one is the god of the preamble. And Ian already mentioned this. Uh, if you read the preamble of the charter, um, it, it mentions, and it's over on the wall, actually. It's always nice to be in a bar where there's actually a charter on the wall. It's fantastic. Uh, it's my kind of bar, right? Uh, if you read it, the opening line of the charter says, whereas Canada is founded upon the principles that recognize the supremacy of God. And that has led some people to therefore grasp that this implies that we are a theistic nation, that the government inherently is theistic. But the judges in Saguenay and other cases have rejected this, um, basically saying this is a political theory. And this is another point that is, is kind of obvious, but a preambulatory clause cannot influence an operative clause. And the operative clause is 2A says that you can't discriminate for people based on their religious belief. And so you couldn't have a preambulatory clause influencing it in that way. And the judge in Saguenay recognized that. And so that argument has been easily dismissed. The tradition fallacy, to get some Latin here, the ad antiquadium fallacy, right? The ad traditio fallacy, as, you, as it were, that tradition is important. We must maintain tradition is often used in defense of legislative prayer. And this is also a terrible argument because that same argument can be used to exclude women, Chinese and Japanese people, of, or people of Japanese and Chinese descent, Dukabors, First Nations people, and actually members of the clergy in BC were not allowed to vote or run for office for the longest time, right? So tradition is a terrible argument. We have to explore our traditions, and some of them are fun, like the tricorn hat that the speaker wears, and I'm quite fond of hats, and yeah, go ahead, fair enough. There's lots of secular traditions that people have, right? Well, there's also some traditions that exclude people, like not letting people of a certain type vote. That's not okay. This is one of those ones that doesn't work. One of the biggest arguments that came up when this issue was introduced and uh, brought up in Ontario was it's a good thing to do, which again implies that a massive bias towards religious values, right? Like, oh, of course it's a good thing to do, but people have a difficulty in articulating why. Um, and if you push that argument any further, it tends to evaporate in the sunlight. And the one argument we heard from MLAs themselves, so in this project, we wrote to MLAs and asked them what they thought. A lot of them said, ah, it promotes diversity, right? And this is really where this project kind of it provides value to the legislative process. Because a lot of MLAs said, look, no, no, we have all these different prayers. We can showcase diversity of religion across uh, BC. OK, cool. Let's find out if that's actually the case. And our study shows that it's totally not the case. But we needed you know, 138 pages and hours of sweat and blood and tears in order to, to show that. And no one could have made that argument beforehand with any sort of leg to stand on. A uh, couple of the random points that often are brought up in defense of legislative prayer is it solemn, solemnizes an occasion. Um, but as I pointed out, there's lots of ways of doing that in a secular way. They don't exclude people. And starting a meeting by discriminating against a huge segment of the population, generally not that solemnizing, right? Um, and then again, the state neutrality arguments, right? So different versions of state neutrality. And in the state, they have different views. So for example, they have the idea of um, what do they call it? It's um, the ceremonial deism. Again, that sort of off-brand religion. Oh, we use prayer in the Senate not to favor one religion, but as a way of making the occasion more, you know, more solemn and adding, you know, lots of, of weight to it. It doesn't work. That argument does not work in Canada. It's been determined by Saginaw not to be the case. Um, and finally, the one that gets brought up quite a bit is you're infringing on individual freedoms, right? You're telling MLAs they can't do something. This is just not also a good argument because saying we're going to have a neutral room here that no one can do anything in is not the same as stopping people from doing private practices. So again, this is a place of work where um, people are working in an official capacity. So if MLAs want to go and pray in small groups beforehand, no one's stopping them from doing that. Um, and if they want to wear religious garb in the house, um, no one's now no longer stopping them from doing that. There's been some controversies about that in the past. But when you're acting in an official capacity as a state, 
you are now, you have the whole power of the state behind you. It's not the same as taking you know, a prayer off to the side. You're act, you are performing your official function. And that's when it ceases to be in a private act and becomes a public act. And that argument has also been found to not be successful. So the one that was brought up in Saguenay, and the reason why parliamentary prayer was not ended immediately in 2015, is the issue of parliamentary privilege. So parliamentary privilege is basically kind of protects MLAs from getting charged with libel and various things in the House. And it was mentioned in Saguenay as something where the judge said, look, we're not going to touch what's going on in the legislatures. We're talking about city councils and municipal councils. Um, and we're not going to touch what's going on in the legislature because we think there might be some issues around parliamentary privilege. This has not been tested at the Supreme Court, so it's sort of a, an open issue. And it's something that would be interesting to explore in the future. Um, but it does sort of raise some interesting questions, right? So what the judge mentioned in a previous case in, in, in Ontario was that parliamentary privilege protects things, but it doesn't protect things that undermine the dignity, integrity, and efficiency of the legislature. And so most people would say, okay, does parliamentary privilege just protect sex discrimination or racial discrimination? or you know, sexual orientation discrimination, right? If there was a policy in the legislature that said that men and only men could talk, we would all agree that parliamentary privilege would not protect that, right? I'm, I'm sure we'd all agree on that. Um, and it, it, so it seems rather problematic that we would say, obviously you can't discriminate based on you know, protected things like race and sex and sexual orientation, but religious belief somehow gets a pass, right? So that's a question that's still up for grabs and it's one that we were kind of still exploring. But it's definitely one that our society has to think about because parliamentary privilege can only go so far. At a certain point, we have to say, you know, it protects MLAs in this context, but not in this context. Okay, on to the study. That was a preamble. Any random last questions before we get into the content? Okay, I'm not going to do the teacher thing away for 10 seconds because we want to press on. But basically, as you can see from some of the arguments, one of the big outstanding questions is, does legislative prayer in BC discriminate against people? It could be that it's beautiful and it covers all possible belief systems, right? So there was a previous study done in 2017 that kind of tipped us off to the case that this is probably not going to happen. They looked at every single throne prayer from 1992 to 2016. The reason they did this was because those are transcribed. So they're part of the record. And they crunched the numbers. It's also really easy, um, so respect to our coders, because you know they're inviting someone to deliver a prayer. That person has a religious affiliation. So when Father Smith from the Baptist Church of Vancouver delivers a prayer, we can probably assume safely that it's a Baptist prayer. And that's what that research study did. And they found that 67.7% of the prayers were Christian, 12.9% were non-denominational, again in air quotes, because that's probably not possible. 9% um, uh, were indigenous, and so on and so forth. And that does not reflect the representation of BC. So um, the 2011 household survey found that 44.6% of British Columbians were Christian, 44.1% uh, declared no religion, and it goes dramatically down from there. 4.7% uh, declared themselves as Sikh, 2.1% as Buddhist, 1.8% as Muslim, 1.1% as Hindu, 0.5% as Jewish, and, and 0.8% as other. So we have a huge disparity looking at just the throne prayers between the prayers being delivered in the legislature and the religious values and beliefs of British Columbians. But that's a sample of like 23, right? And so one thing when we're looking at data is we want to have a bigger sample. So what we did was we said, we're going to look at all the prayers in the legislature. Easier said than done. They didn't start recording the content of the legislature until 1970 in Hansard. 1972, they started transcribing stuff. But as I mentioned, the prayers are not transcribed, right? 1991, they start broadcasting it on cable but there was no PVRs back then, and so no one knows what happened anyways. Um, and we don't have webcasting, <laughs> sorry, cheap shots at, at you know, old tech, right? Um, 2003, we start getting web hosting. So from October 6, 2003, we start getting video sessions. And the problem, again, is they're not transcribed. So we, hire, we, we recruit 52 volunteers who transcribe 877 prayers. We actually made them transcribe more. I gave them 70 additional prayers to transcribe just to check for their, um, their accuracy. And they were very good. We had about 5.7% error rate. And um, we also looked at the pre-written and, and written down throne prayers. We also wrote to MLAs to ask them their opinions. And we got a, a wide range of views from people defending tradition to people saying they were uncomfortable about it. So that was quite an interesting spread. We had two coders, our two summer students, who coded all the prayers. I'm very glad they did this because I really didn't feel like waiting through 871 prayers. Um, they coded all of them, and then where there was a discrepancy between their coding, a third coder would code them, and we would figure out what the, what the result was. And in the end, 
we had 866 prayers and 23 thrown prayers. The numbers kind of move around because sometimes when we're running the stats, we're looking at only the prayers from MLAs, and sometimes we're looking at the prayers from MLAs with the thrown prayers. So when I give numbers, and if you're thinking, ah, that one doesn't quite add, 866, that one's higher, that one's lower, it's because we've excluded some because they don't fall into the data set. So just be wary of that. I know that the crowd here is gonna have some people who are data conscious, and I, like, I respect that. So as I mentioned, MLAs can deliver a standard, one of five standard prayers, and exactly half of them chose to do that. So 434 did that. And we, um, we also noticed that MLAs were changing them a bit. So sometimes they would blur the two together. And I don't know if that was just bad reading or they like liked parts from some sections and not others. But we found that uh, actually 32% of them used a standard prayer and then edited it. Whether they combined two or they vamped a little bit, so on and so forth. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Getting to the structure. So, and this is what I mentioned earlier, 91.9% .9 of the prayers ended in amen. So that's kind of interesting, it's particularly when we get to some of the other numbers. So the first thing we looked at was the structure, right? So ending in amen is one thing. What other kinds of things were there other than prayers? We had poems, there were six poems, 46 quotations that were typically quotations that weren't directly from a religious text, eight references and two moments of silence. So you don't have a lot of, of different content. And on top of that, even the secular prayers, as I mentioned, 88.7% of the secular prayers that we coded the secular, which I'll get to in a minute, had amen at the end. So people feel a lot of pressure when they're delivering a prayer to end in a way, a form that conventionally ends in a prayer with, with amen. That's very much uh, a tradition from a very narrow range of religious faiths. And so again, you can see the way that people are, are forming their prayers to fit with what they're asked to do. It's like if you were asked to give grace, and rather than giving grace, you gave a, a 35 minute monologue using beat poetry. Right? Most people would see that as generally breaking the, the confines of what grace is. But if it's an open form, why the heck not? Have fun, right? Go do some, do some you know, you know uh, old school poetry, right? So the next thing we looked at was, was religious language. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to eat around the core of the apple of like, how do you identify a prayer that is religious and what religion is it? So religious language can be a bit of an indice for that. So for example, if the prayer names a deity, so Yahweh, Jesus, Buddha, whomever, then it's probably a good indication that there is a religious content in that prayer. But beware, there was one MLA that decided to um, use the cheeky line of um, God bless separation of church and state. And we, we caught that one. And that course revealed to us that we couldn't just have a computer code these things. We had to have humans reading them to say, read the prayer, because otherwise that prayer would have come up as religious. It's got God, it's got bless in it, but it was definitely not a religious prayer, right? So we had to have our lovely humans read through the prayers and use their best interpretation to do that. Um, and they did an amazing job. We also um, did 100 prayers and then recoded and then did those, all the prayers again to make sure that our coding was really spot on. We wanted to make sure our, our data was really robust because we're trying to make a very compelling argument. And as conservative, um, uh, as more, the better the data, the better in this case. Oh, a couple of the random things. Um, nine of the prayers contain the Lord's Prayer. So despite what other provinces like Ontario do, it's super not popular here in BC. When given the choice, most MLAs will not pick it. Okay, so let's get into the coding. This is the fun part for those of you who like coding um, and the historical part is also for those who like history. So we identify things as not being a prayer. So something is not a prayer if it's not a prayer, right? Um, but that would be things like poems and uh, poems and, and sections from books. We coded things as secular invocations if they were not directed or invoked a deity or the transcendent or the divine or the supernatural. They may still end in amen because we found, again, a lot of them end in amen. But if it was a statement like, let's all hope that BC does well in the upcoming football game, that it, even if delivered in time for a prayer is, is not necessarily invoking the divine. By the way, there weren't any, any football related prayers that we came across, although that would have been interesting. We then had non-sectarian prayers. And these were prayers where they invoked the divine, but we couldn't identify the denomination. And we were incredibly conservative with this because we recognized that things like Holy Father, Our Father, is a term that can be used, or Heavenly Father rather, is a term that can be used across different denominations. So we didn't automatically pick something as Christian if it had Heavenly Father in it, because that's a term that's also used, for example, by Mormons. And so we were very conservative in this respect. Um, and then the fourth one was sectarian. And this is when our wonderful coders could identify what sect it came from. So this is a Christian prayer because it mentions Jesus, or this is a Jewish prayer because it mentions Adonai. Um, and so we were able to clearly identify the, the prayer itself and where it came from. When we broke all that down, it turns out that 21.7% of the prayers were sectarian. We could clearly identify the religion. 
49.5% of the prayers were non-sectarian. So we were conservatively you know, unsure exactly which um, religious denomination it was. 27.5% were secular. And again, those are non-denominational in air quotes. They were still religious sort of invoking in some way. And 1.4% were not prayers. So like poetry, moments of silence. When you look at the prayers that are sectarian and non-sectarian, so those are the prayers that are, are religious, right? Um, we found that that was 71.2% of all the prayers delivered in the legislature. So they are religious of some, some nature. Remember, we look back at the demographics for BC, that it's not 71% Christian or religious in BC. We definitely have it was 44, at least 44% of folks that are not religious. When you look at the sectarian prayers, and this is what gets really interesting, so of those 21.7% of the prayers that were sectarian, where we could identify the religion, 93% of those were seen as Christian. So when we could identify the religion, it was a Christian religion, which again is a bit problematic when you look at the vast diversity of religious views and, and belief systems we have in BC. So um, Ian also mentioned we were gonna talk about First Nations content, so we did that as well. So we looked at prayers that contain First Nations content, and this broke down in a bunch of different ways. Some of the prayers mentioned a single word, which was um, actually very often sabak. Now, it was kind of fun doing a bit of the detective work to figure out what this word meant, um, because the um, First Voices website is very hard to search when you just have a phonetic spelling from a couple of amazing transcribers. So we ended up calling up Doug Donaldson's office. He's the MLA from Stickheim, because um, he was the one who almost inevitably skewed our stats because he used Sabak in almost every prayer. Called up his office and were like, hi, I have a very strange question for you. Your MLA ends his prayers in the legislature with Sabak. What does that mean? And the person on the phone, you know, ran outside and, quote, asked one of the aunties outside, what does it mean? They said, oh, it's Gitsan for sort of be praised or thanks or something along those lines. Um, and so that clarified it because Sabak could also have been a Hebrew word that was used by a sort of more uh, charismatic uh, Christian fellowship in the States. So we definitely had to clarify that. 42 prayers had a single First Nations word in them. Most of them were Sabak, some of them were Hashka, and there was other terms used in that context. One prayer had a, a First Nations sentence. One had multiple sentences, and five of them were completely or almost completely delivered in a First Nations language. Um, and three of those were delivered by uh, Chief Elmer George of the Songhees Nation. So when you combine those with a couple of other prayers that mention First Nations content, and Indigenous content rather, um, in English, we found that 52 of the prayers had that kind of content. So again, not that significant, but as we found out in the statistics, that number's been increasing over time. So it has been increasing which kind of suggests that it wasn't very good back in the day, <laughs> right? So we looked at the, um, we, now we started getting into the analysis, right? Uh, we also, oh, by the way, we also looked at other languages that were used, but it was, you know, there was one or two Hebrew statements. Someone read the, um, the Shema. There was a couple of um, Muslim prayers and, and prayers in, in various other languages. It wasn't significant enough in that way. And um, I actually learned that the, uh, the Shema, the, uh, not the Shema, but the, the prayer for the dead, in, the Jewish prayer for the dead is actually in Aramaic, not Hebrew, which is very interesting, um, which kind of also skewed our numbers a little bit. But um, yeah, so we start looking into the prayers given. And what we found was that the number of MLAs delivering the prayers is going down. And a lot of it was the same people um, and the same person, actually. So we had one MLA that was delivering like a considerable amount of the same prayers. And if you look at the league tables in the report, you can see he's topping off all of the prayers. And it's, it's actually kind of like he was at a race to see who could do the most, um, which kind of suggested to us that the process for deciding who delivers a prayer is basically people sitting around a caucus table and asking who wants to deliver it. And again, people who are not religious are not going to be comfortable or you know, want to deliver a prayer. And that kind of already excludes people in that context. So that was sort of a bit of an early finding. When we start looking and breaking it down by party, we start getting to the really interesting stuff. So I'm gonna get my notes here because it's uh, the numbers I always wanna make sure I'm getting them right here. Okay, so yeah, steady increase in First Nations prayers, that was important. Um, we also found that there was a divide between parties, right? So when the NDP MLAs were much more likely to deliver a prayer that contained First Nations content. Again, skewing heavily because of the two um, Northern BC MLAs who did a lot of the heavy lifting on that front. When we looked at partisan content, and um, this was really hard to tell because our coders, in order to protect our data, we took the party affiliation away from the, the MLAs because obviously we didn't want to have any sort of influence when they were coding. And so it was very difficult for them to determine when a partisan swipe was taking place. 
Also, some of them were super subtle, right? Like there's a lot of really subtle ways that you can take cheap shots at your opponents across the benches that members of the public, even really astute political scientists, would not be aware of unless you were up to date on the issues of the day. Well, you know, so the more recent ones, we can sort of pick up with a flavor. But 2003, you know, there's some issues going on and someone makes a reference, they pick a specific quote about farm workers. In order to determine whether that was a partisan swipe, we would have had to go through the, you know, the, the newspapers of the day to find out that there was a farm worker strike in Surrey, who knows, right? So we didn't do that, <laughs> but, because uh, that was just, that would have been way too much. But our amazing coders did find 10 prayers that were overtly partisan, right? That were definitely taking cheap shots at people. And so that, again, kind of shows that when you give politicians the ability to deliver prayers, they might take the opportunity to grandstand and select topics that are appropriate. Think again of shipping contracts and taking cheap shots at, uh, at unions. So that was a bit of an issue. What we found too was that there was a divide between the parties when it came to delivering content that was made up or content from the pre-prepared prayers. And that was also kind of interesting. And what we found was that the liberal MLAs are much more likely to reach for the pre-prepared prayers and to prattle them off very quickly than the NDP ones. Um, and that breaks down to about 64 to 35%, which is kind of interesting. Also, NDP MLAs, slightly more creative. They were more likely to amend the pre-prepared prayers. So they would take, the, they um, apparently altered the prayers 55.1% of the time, whereas the liberals only altered them 22.5% uh, of the time. So liberal, ND, uh, liberal MLA, uh, NDP MLAs, a little more likely to go off script, but to sort of, you know, to build on in that respect. Um, we also found that over time, the, there has been a steady decrease in the number and use of the pre-prepared prayers. The MLAs who are volunteering for the prayers are reaching for their own scripts and writing their own content, which is kind of interesting. We also found that the prayers over time are getting more religious. So basically you have prayers that are getting more religious, they're becoming more creative in a sense. And one other thing which we found was they're getting longer. So MLAs are taking more time to deliver their prayers that are more religious. And so that was kind of some interesting information as well. Furthermore, religious prayers were longer in general than secular ones. So that, that's kind of an interesting fact. And the, this is an interesting one. The liberal MLAs used 1.8 times more words when delivering a sectarian prayer than the NDP MLA did. So apparently being slightly more religious and more sectarian in your prayer makes it longer. Um, that's, there's some, definitely some causation um, factors we could look into in that one as well. And again, Christian prayers were much longer. So despite them making up only 20.2% of the total prayers given in the legislature, they comprised, uh, composed rather 25.6% of the 70,079 words used in the legislature. So again, more religious prayers becoming a bit longer. And so these were some really interesting findings that we had, and they kind of confirmed a lot of the stuff that we, um, We'd, we'd see in other reports, basically that they, you know, the prayers are becoming more religious and longer was a new finding, uh, but that the prayers didn't accurately reflect the makeup of BC was actually kind of confirmed by the previous study. So get to some more of my analysis here, or our analysis rather. I know we have uh, we have all the error bars that people want to to really delve into them. What about the rate of religious usage uh, between the parties? Oh yeah, that, that varied as well. Where were my numbers in that one? That was the. Um, that was where, where the NDP was much more likely to deliver secular, secular prayers than the liberals. Um, I will find my numbers on that when they're jumping through it quickly. Let me find those for you after. But yes, but overall, generally, the NDP were delivering more secular prayers than not. And again, if you break down those numbers and you compare them to surveys of British Columbian populations, you find a massive discrepancy. So the only number we have, and this is because Harper um, destroyed the long form budget, uh, not budget, the long form uh, <laughs> census, um, and has destroyed tons of potential great social science uh, comparative studies. Uh, and there's lots of reasons to not like Harper. That's probably number five. Talk to me about the DFO libraries, it's number four. Um, but so we have the 2011 um, household survey. But the BC Humanists also did some of their own surveying. So we have a study from 2013, and we have the 2001 census. And either way you break it down, let, let's use the 2013 um, BC Humanist study. It's quite robust. It found that 25.5% of British Columbians were Christian, 64.2% had no religious affiliation, 0.8% were Sikh, 1% were Buddhist, 0.5% were, uh, were Muslim, sorry. Uh, there was 0.4% were Jewish, 
4.1% were other religion and 0.7% were I don't know, which is always a fun inclusion when in one of your surveys um, <laughs> causes social scientists some, some anguish. Uh, that's not what we found in the prayers, right? So when you look at the sectarian prayers, 93% of them were Christian. And when you look at all the prayers overall, 20.2% of them were Christian. Right? But then when you start looking at the non-religious affiliation, right, people who probably are non-believers, they're severely underrepresented because we really struggle to find prayers in that nature, right? Because even the, the, secta the non-sectarian ones or the secular ones still have religious content. Um, Ian, Ian mentioned the First Nations content. Again, we saw a steady increase, but honestly, like one word uh, by the same two MLAs, isn't really you know, reconciliation. And so one of the conversations that we're interested in, we're currently having with different stakeholders is we start each session with a prayer that excludes some people, but we could conceivably start it with a First Nations territorial land acknowledgement, which could be more inclusive or you know, be, depending on how it's phrased. So this kind of brings us to some of our recommendations, right? So the first recommendation was, um, make sure I didn't skip any of my analysis. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, so the first recommendation was abolish legis legislative prayer entirely, right? Saguenay found that it discriminates. It definitely discriminates because we found that it does not adequately represent the population of British Columbia. And the easiest thing to do is just to stop doing it, right? You strike out uh, Standing Order 25, you amend it, no big deal, right? I mean, you talk to Dalton McGinty about no big deal, but by the same token, um, super straightforward. Our second recommendation was you could replace it with the First Nations Territorial Land Acknowledgement, right? Because that could be more meaningful. And we're not just talking about a pro forma thing that someone reads off a script. We're talking about you know, a process that maybe invites um, an elder from a different group to deliver a territorial land acknowledgement. Um, what we said in our report was basically, we don't want to prescribe how that process works. It's not for us to say, but it might be something we want to explore as an alternative that would be much more accommodating and much more beneficial and much more promoting of diversity than starting with an exclusionary prayer. Um, furthermore, you could replace it with a moment of silent reflection, right? Get everyone's head in the game. We can't police people's brains, right? And different religions have different conceptions of what is silence. And so getting into literature in this was really interesting because someone said, ah, a moment of silence is necessarily discriminatory because it's a Buddhist practice. And someone else said, no, 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 no. We have monks that, that take vows of silence. It's a Christian practice. It doesn't matter. You could be sitting there you know, checking off your grocery list or praying to your deity or thinking about your, your next heckle or hopefully thinking about not being offensive to a member across the aisles if you're in parliament, um, given recent issues here in, um, <laughs> in Ottawa. Um, you could get your head in the game for a minute and that would be fine. That's what they do in, in Quebec, right? Those are our main recommendations. But we also recognize that sometimes change takes some time to to take place. So some of our other recommendations were the Scottish model, which is really interesting. What Scotland does is they take the demographic data and they invite that number of people of those different groups to deliver reflections before their meeting. So if 12% of Scottish people are of the Baha'i faith, then 12% of the invocations over a period of four years are going to be delivered by people of Baha'i faith. And the really fun thing that happens there, the really inclusive thing that happens in that case is if 45% of Scotland is um, non-believers, like for example in BC, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but let's pretend it is, they start inviting people to, to deliver secular invocations, but they're not just like, secular invocations is a pretty broad term. And so they actually had someone deliver something in British Sign Language, which is really interesting and, and it encourages people to learn more about inclusivity and accessibility, right? So that's one option. The only problem they had in Scotland was they were really good at getting the prayers to match the demographics um, as far as beliefs but they really got the gender wrong. And so it's almost all men. And uh, so they kind of got like, you know, women and gender non-binary people or trans folks are not represented in the Scottish um, legislature in this case. And you start getting these problems of overlapping aspects and it becomes problematic. But you know, it's better than the current practice. We also drafted our own set of prayers that we thought, look, if you're gonna give prayers, you might as well give them as secular as possible. Right? And so we have the BC Humanists uh, recommended list of possible prayers. Um, it's kind of challenging calling them prayers, but it kind of ends up being part of our, um, our process. I'm going to try and find my favorite one here because it's, uh, here we go. We were trying to write secular invocations that were truly secular and it was very difficult. So we kind of had two options when we were writing these. And I think we also consulted with some folks here that maybe provided some, some feedback on that. One of our thoughts was, let's build on Saguenay. So Saguenay says the state has to be neutral. And a lot of folks said, well, but you know, when you say you can't have prayer, you're discriminating against non-believers. And Saguenay said, no, 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 no. In that case, true neutrality is abstention. 
So our alternative was, okay, well, if you're going to allow for religious prayers that affirm the existence of a deity, whether whatever kind of deity that is, perhaps you should have a prayer that starts with something like, there are almost certainly no gods. Therefore, let us commit ourselves to tackling the challenges that face our province with reason, wisdom, and empathy, right? Not bad, right? <laughs> Again, if you're going to allow all viewpoints, we should have these kinds of viewpoints. We didn't get any statements in the legislature that came close to that. Um, that's, my, that's my personal favorite. We had a couple other good ones that were decent. Um, you know, we come from a variety of backgrounds and interests, but the passion that ignites us all, a passion for improving the lives of British Columbians, let us, let us fulfill the great responsibility we have been given with reason informed by compassion, reason, and science. You know, not bad, right? Um, it becomes really challenging to write these, and, and I'll probably close off with this last bit, which is, you know, we had some MLAs really trying hard. My favorite one was, was one MLA, and I don't have it in front of me, but it, you know, verbatim it was basically, look, we live in a very diverse province with a wide range of beliefs with diverse people working in different areas, and they were trying so hard to be as inclusive as possible, but they end their prayer with, in Jesus' name. And you're sitting there, you think, oh, you got so close, you got up to the finish line, and you stumbled, come on, you could do better than that. So I guess in, in summary, this is still a live project, right? So we're, we're currently working with First Nations folks to see what they think about potentially um, including a, a land acknowledgement. Um, we're gonna be doing updates of the report, so we're gonna crunch the numbers from the last two years or year and a half since the project ended, and we're gonna try to evaluate the extent to which the change in the legislature influenced um, the content of the prayers. So again, we went from prayers to prayers and reflections. Does that change the content? Well, we don't know. We're gonna have our researchers crunch the numbers again and find out if it does. Um, and then there's a lot of other things that we're currently looking at, um, including prayer in municipal councils. As I hinted at, we found when we looked into it, 26 municipalities that continue to start their sessions with prayer where Saguenay says it's totally not okay. So with that, uh, and because almost all of the non-sectarian and sectarian prayers ended with amen, I will end with amen. <laughs> and yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah, and um, so mode it be or whatever you want to use there. Uh, but I'll go to questions here. But thank you all for coming, and thank you for those of you who volunteered. I know some people in the campaign, some people here may have actually volunteered. I don't know what your faces look like. You were all names on a database, but we transcribed a lot of prayers. There was a lot of data, and uh, it's actually a unique study. So there hasn't really been a study like this anywhere else. Um, mostly because legislatures either use preset prayers or you can't find the data. Or when they turn off the cameras, it's great because it creates more privacy, but it's really hard for researchers because you don't get to see the data. So there hasn't been a study like this done before, uh, and we have released all of our data. So our coding is in the last 27 pages of the report, and it's fantastic coding, I'm sure. I don't know coding very well, but I know it's it's probably very strong. Um, oh, and, but you mean the, the, the analysis? Oh, no, like the, 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 the computer coding is in the report. Yeah, yeah, that's all in there. And then um, all of our, our the prayers, the transcribed prayers with the coding attached to them is in a publicly available database that other people can download. There's tons of stuff you could do with this data, right? You could look at religiosity by party over time, which we did. Um, <laughs> What else could, we basically did all things we could think of doing. But for example, if you were a comparative liturgy, liturgy student, you could look at um, the different comparisons between parties and look at the content. One of the things we couldn't get into was, um, and I really wanted to do, was to look at who the prayer is directed to. Right? There's a difference between a prayer that asks the deity for something and a prayer that thanks the deity for something and a prayer that gives general thanks. Right? And in theology, and I promise a bit of theology, so here it comes. In theology, there's a huge conversation about like, is it okay to ask a deity for something, right? So if, a, if there is a, a God character that believes in all things and knows all things rather, um, and is all powerful, but has already decided what's gonna happen, if you're praying, are you basically annoying it? Because you're challenging its decisions, right? And, there, and then that's sort of a flippant way of saying like a very live issue in theology today. Like, is there something, can you actually pray to a deity and look for results, right? So there's a lot of really cool stuff that can be done with the data. Um, and with that, I'll go to questions, but thank you all for coming out. And yeah, it's been, it's been fun. Thank you. <laughs>